Um, Liz is having, we're having a little bit of technical difficulties, yeah. but we're going to, we're going to make it work. Can you hear me now, Liz? I can hear you. Yes. Okay. Can you see okay. me? Yeah. Well, I can. We're still getting the flickering and stuff. I think uh, what I may do is I'm actually going to hide your screen and yeah. see if we can still hear you because we can't see you. Yes. And um, no, if I, I hide you and see for that, oh, there you go. Mm -hmm. And um, and we'll go ahead and uh, and chat anyway. We'll just we'll have to see you in pictures rather than in. <laughs> The in the ghoulet <laughs> Halloween thing that is happening. Exactly. Reason. It's the Halloween version of the Klein and Company Insider Live. So. Yeah. <laughs> well, everybody, um, as you know, I'm Robin Klein, and I am very excited today to have Liz Bean Cruxton with me of Bush and Beyond. These are properties that are in Kenya, and there's some really fabulous, fabulous properties that she is going to tell us all about. So um, Liz, why don't you go ahead? Um, can you hear me okay? Oh, okay. All righty. Okay. okay. Yep. There you are. There you are. Okay, good, good, good. Okay. So in this weird black and white, I apologize, everybody. I don't know why it's doing this. So well, that's that's all right. We'll 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 get through it. Um, I guess you know, and I'm learning still a little bit about this uh, the software that yes. I have to use for this. And I think that one of the things that happens is when you hide the screen of somebody, they can't talk, which is kind of annoying because I'd rather sometimes yeah. show the pictures in a larger picture, but. We'll, we'll do the best we can with what we've got. So, um, exactly. yeah, yeah. So what I'd like to do is go ahead and talk about um, some of these pictures. Can you see what I've got up on the screen? Yes, I can. Thanks. Okay. All right. Perfect. Perfect. So I'm going to see if I can get, I'd like to get that one a little bigger, but once again, technology not being my friend. So we'll, uh, we'll go with the original view there. Okay. So tell us well first before we begin tell tell us how many properties there are in the bush and beyond portfolio um in uh hi sandy <laughs> in the uh portfolio there are now if i start at the top um Lobolo and lake turkana uh sarara so sarara camp and sarara tree houses in naminuk um omalo and omalo house um in the laikipia area Lewa House down in the Lewa Wildlife Conservancy. And then uh, we have in the Mara, our two properties, Tanglia Mara, that image you're seeing right now is from Tanglia Mara, and our newest member, uh, House in the Wild in the Mara. And then last but definitely not least, our property in Nairobi, the Amacoco. You know, and I think what I'll do is I'll put Amacoco up since we just started talking about that and hide that one. There we go. And why don't you tell us a little bit about Emacoco? Um, I was fascinated when we had our, our call before this about the property and what makes it so special. So let us know about that. And I'll kind of go through the slides as we're talking. Perfect. Um, well, the Emacoco, I mean, what, one of the wonderful things sort of first and foremost about the Bush and Beyond portfolio is that they're all independently owned properties. And so the owners are there on site. They look after your guests when they're staying with, the, with us. Um, and that, so that's common to all of them. The second thing is all of them sit in private conservancies and wildlife destinations. So people forget that while Nairobi is a capital city and, and the largest city in, in the country of Kenya, um, over uh, 5 million people there, that there is Nairobi National Park, which is Kenya's oldest uh, national park and wildlife destination. And so the Emakoko is this amazing lodge that looks right out into Nairobi National Park. So while you're in this major metropolitan city, which is literally you know, 15 minutes away from the Amacoco, you feel like you're starting your safari as you mean to go on. So yeah. you have all the conveniences of, of what you'd want in a city um, lodge. Um, and so, you know, Wi-Fi, amazing food, fantastic rooms, but on your doorstep, right at that pool, when I was over um, just last month, we had buffalo at the pool. Um, so you kind of, you know, have this amazing safari experience right from the moment you arrive. Um, so you know, it makes it very special. 
I was amazed when we were flying out of Nairobi in our you know smaller plane um, how quickly I looked down and I was like oh my gosh there's you know the animals and the vehicles and the, you know I, I couldn't believe I, I didn't even know that before I'd gotten yeah. there that it was there so it's really that's fabulous because it you know as, as much fun as it is to go out to the Mara and all these other places you know if for some reason you can't it's right there yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. It's a it's an amazing um, thing to have that you know happening um, right in your doorstep. And and I forget. Um, ooh, look, we came into color. Oh, there you are. And how exciting is that? Yay! That is awesome. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Great. I played around with it while we were chatting. So there okay, we go. Well, good. Um, good. Um, so, uh, it's, it's fantastic. I mean, this photo that you're seeing of these three leopards, there are three resident leopards that are, you know, sort of literally hang around, um, the Amacoco. So, wow. um, I really love it. I, I think what's really wonderful is that Emma and Anton Child, who own the Amacoco, built it and designed it. And they both grew up in Nairobi and felt that, um, people didn't realize how fantastic Nairobi National Park was. I mean, next yeah. to um, I, probably the Lewa Wildlife Conservancy, it has the largest number of rhino um, in Kenya. And so I always say, if you're not going to Lewa or Old Pejida, which are um, two very strong rhino destinations in Kenya, right. um, just pop through Nairobi National Park. Um, you're, there's yeah. over 100. You're going to see them for sure. Yeah. So, that's that's fabulous oh my gosh yeah and uh just so you know sandy says she's going to emma coco in november oh great sandy i'm yeah, thrilled yeah 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 so yeah uh, so and and this picture I, it's harder to see when it's small but you know they, it sort of speaks to what makes nairobi national park and the emma coco so fantastic as you can see this lioness and then in the far distance you see the city center and and as emma childs likes to say you know where you are when you are in Nairobi National Park. Right. And, and I think it actually speaks to what makes Kenya such a fantastic safari destination is they've figured out how to continually live with the wildlife and be a growing you know, country. And, yeah. and, and as you know, that's one of the biggest challenges wildlife face is, you know, is the encroachment of humanity, you know, pressing up exactly. against it. And it's wonderful to see, you know, Nairobi National Park was founded back in the 40s and that it still exists with this major city, you know, happening around it. So it's a, that, it's a great place to sort of start your safari. Yeah, no, it's, it's pretty, that is awesome. Um, all right, so let's go back then to, uh, where are we now? Tangley Amara camp. Oh, okay. So again, which works out really perfectly because I sort of think most people on a safari itinerary, you, you know, you obviously start in Nairobi because um, that's where all the major flights come in. And then the second is, you know, you move to the Mara. I mean, the Maasai Mara is probably Kenya's most famous um, wildlife destination. It's home to the migration, one of the wonders of the world. Um, and what I love about Tangley Amara, because the Maasai Mara has lots of camps and lodges. It's probably our yeah. most populated area and, and, you know, with camps and lodges. But what makes Tangley Amara so special is it's the first Maasai owned and operated camp in the Mara. And when you think about it, the Maasai Mara is the home of the Maasai people. And yes. so to finally have their own camp and lodge that sits at that four and five star level is you know fantastic thing and, and tangalia in the ma language means to lead and so they're the leaders of their community and and have this a lovely tented lodge that sits right on the mara river with fantastic views but like all of our properties is actually in its own private land so it means we can get mm -hmm. out and walk and that's what i love about this photo is we're actually out <laughs> doing a game walk you know <laughs> Yeah, well, um, I, just I, I switched on you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, yeah. And then know. these are the owners. So this is Jackson oh, Lucea, who's on your left, and his childhood best friend, Dominic Nico, on the left. And, uh, oh, sorry, flip it around. Sorry, I apologize. So Jackson's on your left, Dominic's on your right. Um, and um, Jackson is, of course, known to a lot of people. Um, he's considered one of the continent's best guides, and he was the host of Animal Planets, Big Cat Tales, and before that, BBC's Big Cat Diaries. So, you know, he obviously definitely knows the Mara. And then Dominic is a conservationist. Dominic is um, one of the founders of the Lemmick Conservancy. And so oh, really? you know, one of the other 
great things about the Mara is, is we have the reserve and then all of these conservancies that sit around yeah. the reserve. Yeah. Um, and, and Dominic is actually the founder of the Lemmick Conservancy. Oh, so wow. Tangley yeah. Mara, while it sits on private land, we have access into the Lemmick Conservancy as well as into the reserve. Yeah, the, the Lemmick was actually the first place in the Mara that I went when I arrived. My very oh. first experience was at Lemmick. So that's, that's kind of cool. So, oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. And I apologize, you're probably hearing my dog in the background. I have my you know, own wildlife. It, it, it's, yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> So let me, I want to read this to you before we go on talking about this next thing. Um, so Sandy said, what conservation projects is Liz passionate about and how can we as tourists get involved both financially and physically? Which is an yeah. awesome question. Yeah. Great and, question. Um, yeah. 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 And I would say, you know, the nice part is sort of every um, camp and lodge within our portfolio has a project that they are involved in. And we like to expose our guests when they're staying with us um, to those projects, because I think, you know, you and I were talking about it earlier, Robin. I always say, you know, people come for the wildlife on safari, but they leave with stories about the people. And and a lot of the people they get to meet are these um people running projects or the people involved in the project. So, you know, for example, with Tangley Amara, um, one of the things I love is Jackson and Dominic support um, a local school that's there in Narok County. Every bed night is contributing towards that school and, and providing education for the women. And it's a very wonderful thing to see because Jackson is the father of daughters um, uh -huh. and finally had a grandson, but he has only girls as his has his children. And um, uh -huh. You know, for the for the Maasai, traditionally women didn't go to school. Um, yes. You know, it just was not part of their culture. And so Jackson has, of his generation, you know, Jackson's in his fifties, um, has really believed in the education of women. Um, yeah. You know, three of his daughters have gone on to university, and and one of them is actually involved in the camp as well. So they support a local school, and and he feels really strongly in that. Then you know, up at at Omalo, we have the Samburu Trust, and they have women's feeding projects, we have water projects, we have medical projects, you know, so there's always something for our guests to get involved in. And it really just depends on your passion um, yeah. as far as, you know, what you want to do. Yeah. Well, it's so wonderful to, to be able to get involved in, in those things. And well, let me go back to the, I mean, he, what a beautiful, beautiful beast he is. I mean, uh, yeah, I just, uh, you know, what a gorgeous picture. I think that, that scar, um, that's oh, also it? the fun part about, yeah, being with uh, Jackson and his guides is they know all these cats by name, which is, you know, right. quite fun. I, I jokingly say that it becomes like the um, real housewives of the Mara when they start to describe them and who has the rivalries and, yeah. you know, that kind of thing. So. Yeah, uh, that's great. And then the sunsets there. I mean, yeah. gosh, there's just nothing better. No. <laughs> yeah. Nothing like a sunset. Yeah, yeah. And then, so this is a picture of one of the, the tents. tents yeah. So, the, so really, yeah. again, you know, I, I laugh and, and you know, Robin, having been on, on Safari, you know, we talk about the tents and, and camping and, and I mean, unless you're doing a, a traditional mobile camp, which we do offer, you know, our tents are by tents only in the fact that they have canvas sides, you know, you have right. a proper bed, <laughs> there's a flush toilet, shower, yeah. you know. Um, uh, but there is nothing like sleeping out under canvas. I always say on any safari, you want to include a few nights, you know, in a tented camp of some sort. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. I think that that was one of the things I was very fortunate with. Cause I did, when I went, it was mobile camping. Now this next time when I go back, we're going to visit a lot of different properties and we will, we will get to one of those here. Um, but let's go to this next, this lovely, lovely cheetah. Where, where is this cheetah that we're seeing? So this is the Lewa Wildlife Conservancy and, and, you know, Lewa is, is probably the next to the Mara has the, the um, biggest density of wildlife in a, in a compact area. So it's one of the other places I always say you're pretty well guaranteed you know, see four of the big five. The leopard, as you know, is always our most elusive of the big five to see. Um, but um, what makes Lewa so special is it's um, a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Um, and it is home, again, to an amazing population of rhino. 
But what I think makes it so special in combination to, you know, we were talking about the Amacoco and the, and the Mara. So we're talking about Nairobi and the, and the Masai Mara. Well, we're now moving up into the northern part. And what a lot of people forget is that the equator goes right through the middle of Kenya. So you exactly. have the northern hemisphere and you have the southern hemisphere. And, and I always think you, you want to combine both when you're coming to Kenya because you have a very different topography. Uh, mm -hmm. But more importantly, you have different wild. Um, so while we're seeing this cheetah here, you'll also find when you get into the north, a different type of zebra. We have the Grevy zebra, which is highly endangered. Um, and you'll find 30% of the world's population on the Lewa Wildlife Conservancy. So you'll see those, you'll see the Somali ostrich. So the ostriches in the south have pink legs. The ostriches in the north have blue legs. Oh, you know, we have a different giraffe. We, you know, so. Um, I always think it's really fun to do that comparison between, you know, all of those uh, wildlife. Um, what, but the Lewa Wildlife Conservancy, again, is fantastic. You can get out and, and walk and camels and on horses and and these great rooms. Um, Sophie and Calla McFarlane own, own Lewa House. Sophie is the fourth generation of her family to live and, and work here on, on Lewa. Her, okay. her uh, great grandmother was the first to come here. Um, and uh, so really cool cottages. They call these the earth pods and, and they were designed to be able to capture all the rainwater um, and use it um, for all of our watering of our plants and the gardens and, and that kind of stuff. So they're these very cool kind of rooms. They look kind of like hobbits um, houses, yeah. um, but they're beautiful with spectacular view up towards Mount Kenya. Oh, um, and that gives you a sort of sense of the outside of them. So they are all looking out towards Mount Kenya with big verandas and, you know, just perfect spots. Oh, beautiful, beautiful. Yeah, and Lay was yeah, north of Mount Kenya. So you're looking south yeah. from there, correct? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And the other and, thing, you know, again, with Mount, with Lewa in particular is we're moving higher up in elevation. So again, that's one of the things, you know, you and I were talking about, people forget that a lot of Kenya sits at 6,000 feet above sea level. So it's more in, in keeping to sort of Colorado um, and keeping in that way from the weather perspective as well. So cool nights and cool mornings um, in Kenya, pretty well year round. Yeah. And lots and lots of wide open spaces like that. And then, okay, yeah. now who doesn't love this? The I mean, the, the, the rhino yeah. and her calf, that is just like. <laughs> yeah. And it's I'm the one to. place I absolutely guarantee you will see rhino if you're there okay. um, for, you know, within probably about five hours um, wow. and an equal number of black and white um, yeah. uh, on, on the Lay Wildlife Conservancy, it, you know, and they've had a really successful program, um, breeding program, just naturally. One of the mm -hmm. things people um, don't realize because you, you do see white rhino at Lewa is white rhino aren't indigenous to Kenya. Um, they came into the Lewa Wildlife Conservancies in the, in the 1970s because they were being so highly poached in the rest of the continent. Um, a wonderful woman by the name of Anna Mertz, who's since deceased, um, basically was looking for a home for some white rhino. Um, and the Craig family, Sophie McFarland's uh, family, um, said, Sure, bring the rhino here. So the white rhino have been on Lewa since the 70s um, and the population has exploded both black and white to the point that we have moved a lot of our rhinos on to places like Burano, Ejida, Sarah Conservancies and, and other places uh, in Kenya, So, which is fantastic. Wow, that's interesting. So before you tell us the difference between the white and the black rhino, which I know, but I'm gonna let you tell everybody. <laughs> and where are where were the right white rhino from originally? Like where? There, what was yeah, they're a southern African species. Right. So you'll okay. find you'll see those in, in South Africa or, or you know any of the southern African species. Right. Um, but uh, again, they are really um, sort of taken over really well uh, on the Lewa Wildlife Conservancy. That's great. And, and tell um, everybody so what the difference. Yeah, what the difference is between. Yeah. Um, the easiest way to tell you is to tell you that the word white rhino, white wasn't about their color. White was actually the Dutch word, white, which means wide. So mm -hmm. a white rhino has a wide mouth and a black rhino, which you're looking at here, has what we call a prehensile lip. So he has a little lip that kind of comes over a flap that sits over his mouth. 
um, white rhinos are grazers, so they, they tend to eat grasses. Black rhinos are browsers, BB helps you remember. And so they'll eat um, shrubs and, and that kind of stuff. So also helps you to identify their dung, et cetera. But, uh, um, and blacks, and that's why you see this mama, um, black rhinos um, are um, hard of hearing. So they keep their babies very close. Oh. White rhinos are actually hard of seeing. So you can get very close to white rhino on foot um, because they, they don't see you, that it takes them a long time, but they have these amazing ears that actually turn um, like radar scopes. So they, they can turn on almost backwards. It's quite amazing to see. Oh, wow. Wow, yeah. that's awesome. That's that's amazing. So is there any difference in their horns? I mean, I, sometimes you see some that have like a horn that's not this long and pointy yeah. like this one is to the and, white. And the black yeah, horn. the black rhinos tend to get a much more pointy horn and, and the white rhinos are a thicker, um, sort of uh, stubbier. They don't get as pointy as um, the black rhino. I, you know, and again, as you know, you know, the rhinos are, are poached for their horns, which really, I always remind people, it's just fingernails. It's the exact I same know. substance. I know. As human it's, just, it's just so heartbreaking. Yeah. I mean, and I've, I follow old Pajetta on the, um, on my mm -hmm. Instagram and stuff. Oh, and yeah. I love the, all the videos with the calves with that they've rescued and they're so social yeah. and they, they seem so kind. I mean, I, I understand you're not going to walk up to one in the wild like that, yeah. but, um, but it is just amazing that, you know, for such a massive creature there, they seem fairly docile. I'm sure if you make them mad, it's not a good thing, but. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, they, I mean, by and large, you know, most wildlife, you know, have no interest in, in being involved with humans. Yes. I mean, they're doing their, their biggest to, to sort of avoid us. Um, and that's why, you know, I always say to people, you, you're, you're very safe on safari, you know, it, the, the chances of having some kind of accident with wildlife is so rare and is usually a true accident in that, you know, you've come across a, um, you know, a, a cub, a mother with cubs or an right. elephant in must or, or something like that. Right. Right, exactly. So, down yeah, so uh, I mean, I could talk about rhinos and elephants all day long, yeah. and then everybody would be bored and drop off. So, we'll move on to something else now, <laughs> which this <laughs> looks just fabulous. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, another sundowner. It's the epic requirement of all, all safaris is the sundowner. Yes, yes, yeah. absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, it's a tradition I like. I, you know, sat out in my backyard and tried to replicate it but it just doesn't doesn't work so. yeah no it never does okay. so sadly yeah all right so let me go now to omalo and there wow, we are you're going. so camels camels uh in, yeah. i mean you wouldn't think of camels in kenya you think of them in you know further north and the more desert yeah. areas and stuff but uh but tell us a little bit yeah. about this well, and again, I think that's a perfect, you know, segue into it. You know, we were talking about the northern hemisphere of Kenya. So I always say you're going to find camels if you're in the northern part of Kenya. Um, and and simply because when you get to further north of us, and, and there, this isn't a safari destination that you'd be going to, but we do move into desert at the northern part of Kenya. So you get up to Lake Turkana and, you, and you're going to be moving into desert. So um, camels are, are part of the Samburu and all of the northern tribes' um, life uh, because, of course, they can go vast distances without water um, and, and they're good, you know, pack animals. And more importantly, they're a source of milk. Um, and again, you know, all, most of the, the tribal cultures, the Samburus, the Pokots, um, the Turkana, the Maasai, are, are, are use milk basically is their diet is not meat based it's it's dairy based be it goat's milk um, cow's milk or camel milk so um so we we offer uh, camels as a as a great activity you can go out and and um, do camel safaris we do full safaris with the camels taking your gear and you can walk or ride with them um, one of the wonderful things omalo does um chulu franco who's married into the franco family who owns omalo Chulu has trained her horses to go with camels. And 
um, which you go, oh, so, uh, well, the only other place in the world that camels and horses actually are comfortable work working together is Mongolia. And Chulu went over to Mongolia to study that because she wanted oh, to be yeah. able to offer horseback riding and camel safaris together oh, so God. that you could go out riding. Camels would carry the gear, but that the camels would feel comfortable with the horses. So, oh, my gosh. Um, so, yeah, so in that weird thing. And there yeah. we have, there we have the horses. There so, we, yeah. Yeah. And I know you're a rider, but I always say to anybody, if, you know, my husband who literally rode a pony at the zoo was probably the only time he's ever been on a horse, get on horseback if you have the chance in, in yeah. on any safari, if, if it's offered, because as you know, having done it yourself, you, the, the plains game in particular, so zebras, gazelles, impalas, giraffe, all see you as another four-footed animal and you can get right into a herd of, of zebra or giraffe quite comfortably um, exactly. and safely, which is a very unique yeah. experience. Yeah, no, it was, it was amazing because the, the safari that I did last year was, it was a horseback safari. Now that doesn't mean that you can't go in the vehicle. And of course you want to be in the vehicle. If you're going to get close to the big cats and things like that, you're not going to do that on a horse, but to, uh, but it, it was great because you could go some places that you might not be able to go in the vehicle. But then when you're in the vehicle, you might be able to get some pictures and see some things that you can't do on a horse. So there's there's a trade off, but we got to do both. So it's the best of both worlds. Yeah. And yeah. And, and I can see Sally's question. And, and just to let Sally know, yeah, at all of our places where we offer horseback riding, the, the horses are there on site. We'll have we have stables and guests can go up to the stables and and you know, participate and including at Lewa as well. Lewa has um, a stables uh, at our next door, our sister property, Lewa Wilderness. So um, when you're staying at Lewa House, you'll go over to the Lewa Wilderness stables and and, and go out, ride out of there. That's, uh, that's awesome. Um, so again, I could talk about horses all day, but we won't do that either. We'll talk, we'll move on to this, which the, um, the colorfulness and the beating and the, um, I don't know what, the, you, you're going to have to help me with the descriptions here. It's just magnificent. Um, yeah. it, it, what yeah, you, what absolutely. Comes. And, you know, the Samburu and Maasai are cousins. So um, you'll find the Samburu people in the northern part of Kenya and the Maasai in the southern part. But I have to say the Samburu are even more colorful. Samburu actually means butterfly. And so um, the colors that the women wear, and here you're seeing the back of young women, and they wear these very large collars. But what I think is so fascinating once you get to, to know and understand a bit more about the Samburu and the Maasai, but the Samburu particularly, is that the women's beaded collars are actually sort of the equivalent of an Amish quilt in that okay. they tell the story of the woman's life. So a certain number of, be of green beads will tell you how many sons she has. Um, oh. Different colored beads will tell you whether her sons are warriors yet. Um, so how many, where she is, if, you know, because the Samburu are, are like the Maasai are, are polygamists, um, will tell you what order she is of, as far as wife. So is she first wife, second wife, third wife? Um, so it's quite fascinating to, to look at it. And, and, it, and also with the children, they'll wear a green bead until they're a certain age, then they switch over you know, the men with their beating, that happens when they're moving into warrior class and all of their girlfriends and sisters and mothers do the beating for them. They're all gifts for them um, as well. So um, wow. it's just spectacular. The beads yeah. are amazing. Oh and at Omala, we have a women's beading cooperative. So guests can go over and meet the women and do some bead work with them if they'd like. Um, we have a wonderful gift store that, you know, obviously sells a lot of their bead work. But what's amazing that Julia Francom has done with the women at Omalo, um, Julia runs the trust there, is she's taken the traditional beading, but has applied it to sort of modern things. So these amazing lampshades or oh, wow. um, bowls and different things that are even carried at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. So um, really That's fantastic. Good. Again, taking the traditional oh beading and, and making it modern. So. Oh my gosh, that's fabulous. Yeah. Well, You're you know, uh, full disclosure, I'm especially excited about this because we're going to spend three days at Omalo in January when uh, we go and um, we still have room on our trip if anybody wants to join us. So <laughs> well, it's a good trip. Like, I've seen the itinerary. <laughs> yeah, I know it is. It's going to be fabulous. So, um, 
Well, that, gosh, I and I wanted to show the picture of the pool there, but it's it says the file size is too big and I didn't yeah. reduce it beforehand. But, you know, if anybody has a chance, go look at that on the website and see yeah. that pool. Because and you and I read something just today that every single one of the properties that you deal with has a pool. Yep, the only one that doesn't is our uh, Tanglia Mara and that tend to camp, and that's because the Mara River is right out front. Right. Um, meaning, you know, uh, but that's the only one. Everything else, everybody else has a pool. Um, and which, you know, you in the afternoons, you know, they all have epic views, anyhow. You would just want to get in the pool to have the view for any, you know. Yeah. Yeah, From well, I can't, I can't wait to experience that. Um, yeah, because the closest thing we got to a pool on ours was the Mara River. And uh, and even yeah. though it was high yeah. and flooding and close to the camp, yeah, it was not appealing to to get into, especially with all yeah. the hippos. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. And the odd so, um, <laughs> Yeah, so speaking of, you know, going, you've just come back recently. And tell us yeah. how you found it, the traveling, you know, I'm now... Our viewers may not know that you are from Canada and went from Canada. And of course, I'm based in the United States. So, you know, some of the protocols might be a little different, but certainly when you get to Kenya, they're going to be the same for all of us, whoever's coming in. So, yeah. so tell us a bit about that. You know, first and foremost, I'm going to tell you now is definitely the time to travel. Um, Kenya has been open um, since August 1st. Uh, and open to all residents of the United States and, and Canada, where I'm from. And really, you know, there's some new requirements to arrive into Kenya, which again, no surprise for people, you know, a negative COVID test is required 96 hours before arrival. Um, you know, you've got to fill out some forms and uh, uh, one new form that you didn't have before. But otherwise, you know, once you're flying, and I will tell you, I flew via Frankfurt on Lufthansa, and I was saying to Robin when we were chatting earlier that, if the flight was 30% full, I'd have been surprised. So um, anybody who's worried about social distancing on a flight, really on international flights, anyhow, um, no problems there. I found moving to the airport really easy. Uh, and then once you're in Kenya, and and I would probably guess this is the same on any safari destination, you know, safaris were designed for social distancing. I mean, exactly. You know, without even realizing what social distancing was, but that was, you know, we, our whole rationale behind a safari was getting you out into the wilderness, away from the rest of the world. So, exactly. um, they're the perfect sort of social distancing um, mm -hmm. type of trip. And and our camps and lodges really haven't had to pivot too much as as far as changing for the protocols. I mean, obviously you know, change it a bit maybe and in, in how the rooms are being cleaned and the vehicles, you know, that kind of changes and, and masks, which are, I think, part of the entire world right. now. Um, but otherwise, they were, you know, they were already set up for, you know, um, keeping people, you know, separated within your own sort of group. Um, really, the only thing at the Bush and Beyond properties that we've sort of had to change is one of the things we've always had is a communal dinner in the evening where all the guests that are staying at our properties, because our largest only has 20 guests, have come together, you know, for a communal meal in the evenings. Um, we've, you know, obviously changed that um, and we have enough dining places and different areas to dine. So one group might be dining out under by the pool and somebody else is up in the dining room and somebody's, you know, out on a private bush dinner. So, you know, that's really the only thing that we've changed. But I will tell you, I felt absolutely safe the entire time, safer than I do here in Toronto. Um, and... <laughs> And we had everything to ourselves, like yeah. everything. I mean, yeah. sadly, there was only one camp where there was an extra guest, but definitely when we were out in the Mara, I, again, I was telling you, we did a 12 hour day in the Maasai Mara, which is Kenya's you know, most populated um, wildlife reserve. Yeah. And we saw 10 vehicles in 12 hours. Wow. And two of them were wow. film crews. Yeah. So, you know. Yeah, interesting. Well, and I, from what the reports I've heard too are that the wildlife sightings are just, uh, you know, even yeah. more spectacular than before. Yeah. And I mean, it's not like there was ever a lot of pressure from vehicles or anything in these conservancies because they're so careful about the numbers of people that come in. Yeah. But I guess there's just been a sense of peace among the animals with no disruption for so long that they're even more relaxed. Is that what you found or? Yeah, absolutely. And, and in some cases, it's quite funny. They've, they've sort of moved into areas that they never have because, you know, there's just nobody there anymore. Um, yeah. 
And uh, yeah, we had just wonderful wildlife sightings. Um, and again, as I said, you know, to yourself and, and to your point, you know, in the conservancies, you know, so I'll use Lewa Wildlife Conservancy as an example. You no, know, the rule in the conservancy itself is that you can never have more than two vehicles on a, on a sighting. But it's even nicer when you're just, it's just you. I mean, you know, yeah, just right. even for photographs, you don't have to worry about getting that vehicle out of the background of your leopard shot yeah. or, or what have you. So, yeah, exactly. Um, you know, it exactly. was, it's, uh, it's a, amazing. As, as Callum McFarland says, the wildlife don't know about COVID. They're just continuing their lives as, you know, normal. Exactly. No, that's right. So tell us about, so most of my friends that I talk to about going on a safari, one of one of the biggest concerns they have is how do you pack that light? And I said, it's really not that hard, but you do have to leave some things behind. So um, tell us what are kind of the essentials that you, know, you recommend you really need to have um, and you know, what do you really not need to have? <laughs> Yeah, I'll, I'll start with the not because that's always yeah. easier for people. Meaning, yeah. my first and foremost is, you know, you are limited for internal flights. It's not your flight over. It's just when you get internally. And and in Kenya, it, it's uh, 15 kilograms if you're thinking that way. Or if you think in pounds, that comes out to just under 35 pounds. Yeah. Um, so, you know, that's little when you start thinking about it. But the big thing to know is that every safari camp and lodge that I know of in Kenya, laundry is included. Um, and it literally, I, you know, you drop it off, you put it in your laundry hamper in the morning, and it will be back to you that evening. It will be beautiful. It'll be folded. It'll be pressed. It will look like nothing you ever do at home, at least in my house. That's right. Yeah. My clothes were all ironed. I mean, like, yeah. you know, the hot iron right. they had over the cold. I mean, they never look so beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> I don't do yeah. that. <laughs> And, and, you know, the other thing to note is, is we're not formal, you know, so it's casual in the evenings. Don't worry about it. I always tell women, you know, put in a few scarves if you want to dress yourself up, but leave all your good, you know, you don't want it. Um, the other thing I will sadly say to every female there is please don't bring your hair dryer. you know, <laughs> partly because, you know, most of our camps and lodges are off the grid, right? So yeah. we're, we're being, you know, the power all comes out of solar. So we're not set up to have a hair dryer. It's why God invented hats, you know, embrace it, just go with it, you know, um, exactly. you know, just leave it behind. So, yeah. so those are the things I say, don't bring. Um, and, you know, and know that, as I said, you know, you really need like, three or four t-shirts, you know, if you wear shorts, you know, two pairs of shorts, you know, a couple pairs of, you know, trousers, you know, so maybe you're bringing four to five bottoms, you know, bring a couple t-shirts, a couple long sleeve shirts so you can layer, like I always said, layering is the thing to do. I love a little light puffer jacket, um, again, because it's cool nights and it's, you can use it as a pillow when you're, when you're on your international flights and stuff. Yeah. Shoes wise, you know, bring one pair of, you know, whether you, prefer to wear a sneaker or a low hiking shoe, not a boot. You don't need that. You know, one pair of flip-flops or sandals, you know, to wear by the pool. And then I always say a pair of closed-toed shoes. So whether you want a ballet flat if you're a female or my husband brings his teeth to sandals, you know, that are closed-toed. You know, that's it. You know, ball cap or, you know, something to keep the sun off you. The things I always say you should bring, my, my essentials are bring your own pair of binoculars. Mm -hmm. It's worth it. You know, don't, you don't have to get really expensive ones unless you're a regular safari goer, but just get yourself on Amazon. You can find a good set, you know, for probably about 50 or $60. Um, but it just makes it so much easier because you are going to want them. Um, and um, it's just, I, some marriages have been broken up over trying to get the binoculars back and forth. <laughs> um, so I would say binoculars. I like it bringing a headlamp. Um, so just a light, again, little uh, headlamp we can get any of your camping supplies just helps you at night when you're walking back and forth. Yeah. If you're waking up in the middle of a room that you don't know, I think a headlamp is, mm -hmm. is really helpful over a flashlight. So that's yeah. one of my others. Yeah. If you I use agree. a camera, bring more memory cards than you think you're going to need because yeah. you just take way more photos than you ever, yeah. you know, you ever think. Um, right. I always say a, a puffer jacket or a, a fleece jacket. People again, forget that it gets cooler. So you do want, you know, some layer like that. Um, and the last is something you can buy while you're in Kenya on safari, and then you'll never leave home without it on any of your travels. And that's what we call a kikoi, 
which is kind of the Kenyan version of a sarong. It's a wonderful cotton cloth that comes in a variety of different colors. Um, and what I love about it is you can use it as a scarf. You can use it as a shawl. You can use it as a skirt when your luggage mm -hmm. doesn't arrive. I've had mm -hmm. a couple of times. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, it also makes, you know, a sunshade. You know, it's just a really practical and it's they're light and inexpensive and they take up no room in your suitcase. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's great. That's a great suggestion. I'll have to do that when I go back because I somehow I yeah. came home with a lot of really cool stuff, but I didn't come home with one of those. So I'll fix that this time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, um, I wanted to also just ask, uh, I think we're, we're getting kind of uh, near, the, near the end here. It's been, it's been yeah. fabulous. Yeah. My gosh, we've used up a lot of time already, which it's just i could talk all day but uh i do have me to, too so that's my problem <laughs> but i want yeah exactly <laughs> i do want to ask you a couple of just fun questions so yeah. what what is your favorite sundowner oh i have to go with the classic kenyan dawa you know which is a kenyan cocktail dawa means medicine so it's kind of the kenyan version of a mojito so it's <laughs> honey lime juice vodka crushed ice you know and you mas macerate it a lot um, and it is the so, has great one that's done with ginger. It's a little yeah. gazingier. Yeah. So yeah. the Dawa. It is, it is so delicious. I'll, I'll tell you a quick story. It's kind of embarrassing. So in our camp, luckily they didn't introduce those to us until a few days into the trip because we got to, I think the day before the end or two days before the end, and we were all wanting our Dawas and <clears throat> poor Molly said, there's no more limes you all drink. We used all the limes. So, yeah. I was like, oh, oh no. <laughs> Oops, yeah. <laughs> so we love those. Okay. What about a book? Like if you were going to tell somebody who had never been to Kenya or on a safari before, I mean, I've got all my favorites that I just yeah. read time and time again, but like what would be, you know, even a, even one of the novels or, you know, historical fiction. Yeah, right? I have What's two your, favorite. And they're both based uh, around the same person. I, Beryl Markham wrote West with the Wind. She's kind of um, the Amelia Earhart of, of Kenya and, and wrote this amazing book. She's a contemporary of Ernest Hemingway and Karen Blixen, who wrote Out of Africa. I just think she's a badass female. And so I, yeah. I love yeah. her story. And then um, Paula McLean, who wrote The Paris Wife, many people know that. She okay. then wrote a fictionalized account of Beryl Markham. I'm just looking oh. my book's out, but they, um, oh. I don't know if that it's called Circling oh, the yeah. Sun. Circling the Sun. It okay. It is awesome. So if you don't want to read Beryl Markham's version, or it's a nice contemporary, you know, okay. to go with that, um, Circling the Sun. And it's out in paperback now. Um, and it's just a again, really great. It all is set in Kenya and it sort of covers all the different parts of Kenya that you go to and, and okay and really focuses on all the differences that are a part of Kenya. So those are my two favorites. Great, great. Um, yeah, I don't know about the second one, so I'll have to get that before we go back this time. So, cause I'm kind of recycling my old favorites right now. So, um, okay, tell me something like something funny or humorous that's happened on a safari that, uh, that tickles you, <laughs> that you can share with us. Um, so, in the evenings, again, I've talked about Kenya getting cool in the evening. So one of my favorite stories happened at uh, one of our tented camps in the Mara. Um, and, uh, you know, you, you're given in your room a whistle or an air horn or something if if something happens in the middle of yeah. it. So mm -hmm. this woman had gone back to her tent and we heard the whistle. We were all still at, at uh, dinner. Um, well, having our last sort of Amarula or drink at the end of the evening. And so we all raced over, you know, to, to see what was wrong. And, and she said, there's a snake in my bed. There's a snake in my bed. And I, I, I smashed it. I smashed it. And it's bleeding everywhere. <laughs> it wasn't a snake. As you know, we put hot water bottles in the bed, but we had just oh, forgotten to let her know that there was going to be a hot water bottle in her bed. So she had come back and seen this lump at the end of her bed and assumed it was a snake and had literally beaten the living Jesus out of the hot water bottle. So it had burst and now she thought she had totally had a bleeding. We now let guests know when they head back to the room that there's a hot water bottle in their bed. Oh my gosh, my that favorite. is that is that is pretty hysterical. Well, I, I do have to admit yeah. that I had been told that, but I'd forgotten it, and I got in the bed yeah. and I was like, oh, you know? yeah. <laughs> but of course, oh, yeah. having been having been pre warned about it, I I very yeah. quickly 
remember that that's what, figured it out. Yeah. Well, and sometimes they're a nice little fur, you know, so you think there's something in the bottom of your bed. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> exactly. So, um, oh my gosh, Liz, you have been great. Thank you so very much uh, for joining me today. I'm really grateful. And um, I do want to say to anybody that's watching out there that uh, I do send every week an update out that ha is very short. It's a three to five minute read, some good information. And um, I'll always share a link to my lives in there and would love for you to become a Klein and Company Insider, which you can do at my website. Uh, just scroll down to the bottom of the homepage and put your information in and I'll be glad to include you on the updates each week. So everybody, um, next week um we'll be back again i actually don't have a uh, guest yet for next week but i'm gonna find i'm gonna find somebody and uh if, if somebody's out there listening and wants to jump in let me know um so sandy says fantastic conversation and that you, really sandy. means a lot to me coming from sandy because she is a pro and I need to get Sandy on. That's uh, that's who I really need to get on. I know she's getting ready. I know. I was going to say, I would put Sandy on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. And um, yeah, she's getting ready to go to Uganda. So I don't know. I might wait till she comes back just so I can hear about Uganda, though, too. Yeah. So I don't know. I'll, I'll chat with Sandy about that. But Liz, thank you. Um, I appreciate you persevering on the technical yeah. difficulties. And um, I'm sorry you're not getting to go to Georgia this winter, um, but the next time, next time you come south and everything, we're, it sounds like we're going to have to get a tennis game up. It sounds like Sandy's a tennis player too, and uh, we I might know, have to get a match going. Yeah, I like so. it. Okay, great. I love it. All right. think, you know, again, I think it's so funny. I can't cross the border into the United States, but we can we can fly to Kenya. So, um, yeah. So take advantage yeah, of it. I've already booked my tickets. Robin and I are going to actually be crossing. We're not going to be at the yeah. same place, but we're going to be in Kenya at the same time. So yeah. we might have to do yeah, a live I'm... from our 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 respective spots in Kenya. Yeah. I want to do several while I'm over there. So for sure. And we'll have to wave at each other in the air or something. So. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Okay. And uh, we'll talk soon, I hope. Thank you. Okay.